Welcome to The Prestige. My name's Rob, I spent most of my life making movies all over the world. My co-host is Sam, I spent most of his life reading, writing and analysing literature and media and together we make a show about movies. Each week we pick a movie, we go deep on that movie, analysing its themes, its effects and hopefully bring some fresh takes to it. I bring the technical and Sam brings the theory. We're currently in our fifth season doing a world tour, starting in Chile and working our way all the way round to the southern tip of Africa, exploring lesser known movies and lesser known cultures. Find the prestige wherever you get your podcasts or on Kaiju FM. Life's a game, the world's a stage, and we are merely role players, where theatrical people play role playing games. I'm Matt, I'm your compare for this backstage episode from our current studio production. Uh, and joining me backstage are, first of all, returning player Josh. Hello, hello. Josh. Hello, hello. Um, Josh, have you ever been to space before? Uh, I haven't been very deep into space. I've been on an aeroplane before, okay. and I've been at the top of the Empire State Building, which is practically space as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> uh, how about in games? Uh, not in role-playing games, mm. actually. I New tend, territory. Yeah, I tend to drift more towards fantasy than sci-fi on that axis, but very excited to see what's up amongst the stars. Great. Also backstage, we have Strat. Welcome, Strat. Hello, Matt. Welcome, Matt. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no one ever says welcome to you. <clears throat> and you it should. is such it is such a quality pun as well. <laughs> it is. I do it most series. <laughs> <laughs> um, Strat, have you ever been to space before, either in real life or in a role playing game? Not in not in real life, sadly. I have climbed many a tree. That's about as close as I've got. But in role playing games, I had well, we did that series that was in space uh, that used impulse drives. So I can't remember what we called it. Uh, it was Parallax, part of the Blackshaw saga. That was the one. Thank you very much. And then I think late was Lady Blackbird in space. We played that game. That was in space, but kind of a different sort of space. Done that sort of space. So I've done a few different sorts of space, but I'm looking forward to one that is um, in galaxies at a great distance from where we are now. Thank you for your, your carefully worded, non-libelous, uh, uh, non, <laughs> non-copyright infringing <laughs> phrasing. Uh, also backstage with us is a, our guest star for this season. Uh, welcome, Fiona. Hi, thanks for having me, you guys. Uh, joining us from the What Am I Rolling and DMs Book Club podcasts. Mm -hmm. uh, Fiona, have you ever been to space? My goodness, when I when haven't I been in space? No, I've never been in space in real life. Um, I've done a lot of sci-fi improv though. So, I like last year we did like a improvised Star Trek episode where I did uh, proper chin monsters, chin aliens. So just turning the webcam upside down, and that I thought that worked amazingly well. Except I I, I messed up all my makeup afterwards oh, whilst no. in a battle, <laughs> so it did look like I had like lots of uh, like red tomato sauce on my lips. Um, but in terms of role playing games, I've done a I've done a couple. Um, obviously, the Wars in the Stars one. I've done that a few times. Um, the one that comes to my mind though, I've played the Wretched, which is like a mm. solo RPG with a Jenga tower, and you're it basically it's very alien inspired, where you take out uh, blocks and stuff like that, and if the tower falls apart at any point, your ship has uh, broken up and you've died, and you have playing cards, and you sort of work your way into like trying to escape, and you think, oh, maybe I will escape. Spoilers. It's very unlikely you're going to escape, and it gives you this whole like bit of hope that you might you might be saved, and it's like no. Uh, but I highly recommend it. It was very thoughtful uh, solo RPG. The the clue to that twist very much in the title of the role playing game. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and 
finally uh joining us backstage is a uh, brand new player introducing Marta welcome hello hello thank you for having me <laughs> uh, you're very welcome we're very happy to have you uh Marta have you ever been to space Oh dear. Well, I do uh, double as an astronaut on my free time. Um, no, I've not been to space. I wish I wish I could go. Uh, I've always been obsessed with space, but um, I guess I've been to NASA in Texas. So that wow. would be kind of close. I have family there and it's like, it's a mandatory visit. You have to go <laughs> if you're there. Um, and I my think parents that's closer did... to space than any of us have got. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm sure they have bits and pieces from space on there. So, you know, just by association. Um, my parents did, I never got to go on it, but they went on the, um, is it the Concorde plane? Oh, yeah. That one technically kind of was in space, right? Kind of, I think. A according to them, you could see the curvature of the Earth. So I'm just going to go with it as a yes. So, um, you know, again, by association, <laughs> maybe they got some radiation and brought it back with them. Um, and then in, in role playing, though, Mostly video games. I have dumped an embarrassingly large amount of hours on games like Mass Effect, etc. Mm -hmm. I like sci-fi RPGs and things like Knights of the Old Republic, etc. <clears throat> so in a way, I have, I guess. Our experiences, whether they are real or not, they are, they are real to us in yep. some ways. Well, we're all going to space uh, in our minds in this game. And... This episode is going to be all about uh, deciding who we're going to be in space, who are our characters. Uh, we have picked our playbooks already. Some of us have uh, made our choices. Uh, some of us are still uh, thinking about some of them, but we're going to go through uh, all of the options that we've picked for our various characters um, that we're going to be playing in this game. Um, Galactic's character creation is pretty simple. It basically consists of picking options from lists some of which are very uh, evocative and great. So let's go through and talk about uh, who our characters are, what they look like, what their backstories are, what they're good at, um, and talk about the choices that we've made. Um, let's start with Marta, since you're our newest person. Let's uh, put you on the spot first. Yay! <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Do you want to cool. tell us which, which of the playbooks from Galactic you've picked? Uh, and what what drew you to that one? I went with the defector because I usually go for rogue type characters and there is one like that in this game but I decided to try something new because you know first time on the podcast I might as well try something extra challenging. <laughs> um, she was never hurt again. Um, so yeah <laughs> I just like I like the the idea of having belonged to one of the big factions in the universe and having experienced that from like a certain perspective and then coming out of it, the process of leaving, something which I imagine was quite, um, how should I put it? Like your mind has to be controlled in a certain way for you to be okay being a part of this kind of structure. And then her, well, their relationship with the other characters with all that knowledge on the back of their minds and how that would play into relationships and strategies and, you know, what they choose to do moving forward. Um, so just, I thought it was really rife for good drama and interesting choices. Absolutely. Yeah, that's what we like to see is choices that are geared towards creating the most drama. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so tell us about this character. I can see that you have uh, named them already and uh, you have you have a look. So let's start there. Uh, what is their name and what do they what do they look like? Well, their name is Revan. For anyone who's familiar with uh, <laughs> Star Wars, they might know <laughs> what the reference is. <laughs> cool character. Um, was also known as 7-CN9, which we'll get into later. And uh, in terms of how they look, I picked uh, Weary Eyes and Sincere Voice. Weary Eyes because I don't think they had a good night's sleep <laughs> or like a <laughs> day of calm <laughs> in, a, in a long time. And Sincere Voice just, I think, because I feel this is someone who is finding themselves and is trying to be as authentic as they can coming from a background where that was not possible. So I think they try to be as honest about everything they say as as they can 
That's really interesting. Yeah, because I guess you could go one of a couple of ways when you've defected from the the big bad organization is you could try and hide it or you could mm. just be totally upfront about it. Yep. <laughs> Um, and what about the what about your wardrobe styles? How do they, how does this person dress? Well, I picked discreet clothing, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> um, a token from someone I love, and repurposed fabric. Um, so the idea is that they left kind of with what they were wearing, and that's it. So they've had to both hide who they were and adapt their their sort of wardrobe with bits and pieces that they've picked up along the way. So they want to be, yeah, discreet, practical. And then the token is just part of kind of the, the backstory and something to ground them and make them a little more human. Yeah. And maybe we'll, maybe we'll meet that person that you love. Who knows? Maybe we will. It's uh, all yeah. good seeds for story. <laughs> cool. So then, so every, every uh, galactic playbook has the choose a look, choose two to three wardrobe styles, and then you get some unique questions for the playbook. So uh, the defector gets, what was the last straw? To choose two things that you are and choose two things that you want to be so let's get into this backstory what was the last straw for Revan? for Revan, it was um they stumbled upon secret plans for an atrocity do, how deep do you want me to go into this <laughs> if you if you have ideas in your head already about what this atrocity was then go ahead and and let's start fleshing out this world cool so the idea that i had for Revan is that they were um essentially not genetically engineered, but it, she was born for a purpose. There's children that, you know, get educated to perform specific roles. And in my mind, Revan was um, a bodyguard type of person, which means that they would be in close contact with very high level members of, um, what are these people called again? The, the mandate. <laughs> the mandate. Yeah, there we go. I always want to say something else. I'm like, no, that's not the right one. Um, from the mandate. So that meant that her upbringing was quite specific and weird in the sense that she was they tried to erase her as a human as a person so that she had no free will and just did her job well without being a risk or a threat to the people she was protecting so it's it's a it's a weird balance that i imagine makes her very good at her job of protecting and fighting and also picking up on threats and information that is relevant, but also being able to like really push down any kind of feelings or emotions that that might bring up. Um, if anyone is familiar with Blade Runner, I imagine they would go through like uh, these weird tests to check that their mind is in the right place. Every oh, like they put Ryan sure Gosling through in the sequel. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not deviating from that. So that's, I thought, or is it, um, was it Galact, not Galactica? What's the name of the movie with uh, Uma Thurman, where they have like the blood tests. Hang on, it'll come back to me. So I think whether they wanted to be that way or not, she's been a witness to so many horrific slash questionable things that that does chip away. And then at some point during the her just she was performing her job, she might have stumbled upon something that was a bit odd and then she started pulling the string and yeah she stumbled upon plans for something pretty horrific i'm talking sort of mass extinction of levels of horrific of you know whole planets disappearing sort of thing and she basic oh she i'm just thinking of myself they basically had like a micro brain meltdown turned around walked out the door and just never looked back just no plan no pre-thinking they just left so <laughs> when everything was settled they were like oh wait now I now I have to deal with this because obviously I can't go back and if they find me I'm dead and also I know about this thing that's going to happen what do I do I've never had to make decisions before so that's where they are at the moment choose to that she is I think she's a reliable friend just because it's it's coded into her DNA to once she trusts you or when you have a relationship with her, she's like in it fully. Um, and also brave because I think she does not have that fear fear factor. It's just it doesn't it just doesn't compute in her brain. She doesn't doesn't The impression I'm getting is like an incredibly competent, dangerous baby duckling who just <laughs> Imprints yes. <laughs> on people that they like and yep, will protect like them. Big cute eyes being aggressively. 
<laughs> can I help you? Can I protect you? <laughs> and now, <laughs> and now that's all we're going to be able to see whenever you speak, Marta. So whenever <laughs> Revan speaks, I'm just going to see a tiny duckling. This detailed backstory, and then suddenly, like, nope, it's a duck. Yeah. <laughs> it's a duck from a distance. Looks like a duck up close. Oh no, it's a goose! <laughs> it's a goose. Goose, goose, <laughs> duck. You never know. Um, and then, two that she would like to be. She would like to be knowledgeable about the space between. I feel she might have had some encounters with this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't call it a force, can I? <laughs> <laughs> we can call <laughs> it a force with a, a, with a force, lowercase yeah, f. <laughs> this this sort of mysterious um, universal energy thing. She's. I think she's come into contact with it a couple of times and been very confused about it and also not been told anything about it. And she's like, okay, what's going on? And then the second one is fitting in with her and this new environment. I think she very much feels like a fish out of water because, yeah, everything is different and new and weird and unknown to her. Fantastic. Uh, we'll come back to relationships in a little bit. Uh, any questions about Revan from anybody else before we move on to someone else? Are you a duck? Just like <laughs> <laughs> If I told you, I would have to kill you. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> and would you kill us with a beak? Or I mean, <laughs> I have concealed weapons all over, and the best way to conceal something is to have it in plain sight. So you know, this will be marvelous, merely role players content synergy to bring in another character that is anodyne based, <laughs> <laughs> based, based on cold snaps uh, mm-hmm. appearance. Um, my question is for Revan: Is is there? She, she seems sorry. They seem to be quite guarded as an individual, uh, and quite wary. Is that is that a good reading? Yes, I think at first, for sure. But I think it, once any kind of trust or relationship is established, she's very much like a child. So that, that openness and that kind of like she doesn't have the layers or the experience that makes you an adult and makes you like that kind of wise guarded person who knows to measure their words and be careful about what they say because saying anything is new so she doesn't understand like okay so I'm thinking therefore I'm saying and that's 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 how things work right that's what people around her did before she just couldn't do it herself sure sure has, sure has that got them into trouble like I, I don't want to say that they, they don't seem naive but it, it seems like somebody like that would be prone to like being manipulated by less savoury sorts have they got into trouble through that I think it, she might give off the wrong impression. And whenever people have tried to take advantage, her analytical mind kicks in. And she can tell when people are trying to like use her or manipulate her. She's very familiar with that kind of behavior. She just gives people a chance to react differently to her. And when they don't, she's more than capable of defending herself and making sure that that doesn't happen. But it's kind of a last, last option. She she doesn't. She's trying not to open with violence because, again, trying to break the cycle. Mm. So that kind of that bodyguard instinct that they have instilled into them, that's kind of comes out and goes. Aha! Threat. I know. Yeah. I know this. Mm. Yeah. I think yeah. it's very much like a weird um, knee jerk reaction. Sometimes, like you have to be careful because she can't necessarily control it all the time. She's working on it. They are working on it. This is something else about the character that is like the choice is purposeful is and the token of someone they loved maybe comes in later in relation to this. These children are very much educated to not be they don't have a gender, they don't have sexuality, they don't have romantic relationships. They're not really full people. So yeah. I would like to hear from Josh next as the uh, the person who has never been to space. In a role playing game, uh, I would like to see what Josh has come up with for a space character for this space role playing game. So, which uh, which playbook did you pick, Josh? Hi, Matt. I chose the Diplomat, which I'm sure you would have been very disappointed you couldn't take yourself. <laughs> <laughs> diplomat. That was the joke. 
Uh, I chose. I chose the. Di- it's all. It's always good when you've got it's to explain kicking your off. jokes. It's kicking oh, off. Oh, wow. my god! Here we are. Let's raise the energy, guys. Let's go. Uh, I chose the diplomat because it was one of the only options available left. Because I chose very, very late. Um, <laughs> you, you, and also- you made the choice to yeah, leave hang the on. choice late. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that's very true. That is very true. My own inabilities of managing my own time. Uh, I chose the diplomat because it's really leaning into my own pompous and self-aggrandizing nature. Uh, I figured I could be a uh, slimy politician style character and use big long words that have no real meaning and yeah just just really lean into that role you in fact have added a whole new tab to our google sheet character keeper full <laughs> of diplomatic speak which i yes. really loved. oh i, I didn't love see that, that. oh is that what that is i was wondering oh. I was like... I just thought that was something in the game. I was like, yeah. we've got to, what's like, this I about? this <laughs> diplomatic dictionary. I'm like, this that wasn't is in- amazing. Wow. So keeping on, keeping on Josh Yard brand, I've massively overthought this character. <laughs> and I thought I really want to try and just use big words completely unnecessarily. Oh and my so, God, I have to scroll. Oh my goodness. You know, so, oh. Li- so literally about, uh, about a week ago, I just Googled, <laughs> Big words that make you sound <laughs> smart, and Google <laughs> Google them, uh, uh, pasted them into this this document. Oh so, uh, in the hopes I get to use some of some of these wonderful, wonderful big long words uh, in my speech. Well, show off some of that, Josh, over over preparation, uh, and talk us through uh, your character's name, look, and wardrobe. Okay, please uh, pray silence for His Excellency Olwyn Callahan the Sixteenth. <laughs> well, you've gone up 10 you were the 6th earlier I was, I thought I, I, if I was the 6th that means that we were really early on in the founding of this galaxy right mm. and I figured with space and time these these sorts of settings are normally quite you know it was 100 years since this happened and blah 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 and if I'm the 6th Olwyn Callahan, that means that everything is still super new and and um, it just seemed a little bit, little bit early so I've jumped up to the 16th now <laughs> Love it. That's impressively consistent for a family, I, I right? have to say. <laughs> well, I figured... That's commitment. I, I think it's a bit of a dynasty. I think the Callahans have always had one member of their family uh, taking the role of this relatively minor diplomat. Um, and they've always been always been named Olwyn. So it's a case of, you know, you Ol, Olwyn the 16th, you must take this role because it was your father's role and your father's father's <laughs> role and your father's 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 role. And actually what it is is that the level of responsibility he's got is close to like local MP. I think it's kind of that level of fame. Like this oh, guy will have a this guy will have a Wikipedia page, but there won't be a lot of information on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Amazing. Firmly um, bank bench. Yeah, one one hundred percent. Um, and it's just kind of in the blood, you know. He would have mm. been enrolled in a, a certain a certain school, and he would have gone to diplomat cottage, co- cottage college. Cottage? Uh, oh, don't go to don't go to that one. Don't go to the diplomat cottage. cottage. That's where you go once you retire from being <laughs> right, Alwyn right, right, Callahan. right. <laughs> Pronouns for Alwyn: he, him. The diplomat has a position of power or influence in the galaxy. Their power comes from their leadership, negotiation, and strategy. So I, I like that you're kind of undermining the concept already by being like, actually, I don't have that much power. <laughs> I think it's like localised power, yeah. right? Because the the idea of sort of like a space-based saga, a space opera, is so uh, immeasurably huge because there are galaxies and solar systems and planets. And so really, localised politics aren't really going to have that much of an effect. A local diplomat isn't going to have as much sway if they're from a completely different corner of the universe to where the setting is. So I get the idea that they're, they're, these these roles of diplomats is very grandiose and very overblown, but realistically it's just the same as talking to like a representative from a village council or you know a, a, lo- a local MP for a, a small uh, a small constituency. So he's often busy opening fates, is that what we've learned? I think so. Yeah, I think opening 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 space fates, fates space fates. Kissing babies. Sure. Probably. Yeah. And I guess we'll find out wh- whether whether it's one of those significant swing constituencies or <laughs> shaking hands. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's not if if the Callahans have always held it. <laughs> it must be yeah. very stable. I think it's an incredibly safe seat. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Right. Well, talk us through the uh, the look and the wardrobe style. So my two look options that I've chosen are formal speech and polite smile. 
We, we've we've covered the formal speech in detail already. <laughs> yeah, the polite smile I think is uh, like an American politician smile, both top row, the top and bottom row, <laughs> on full display when smiling, pearly whites, you know, perfect teeth. But that sort of smile of "Hello, how are, how are you? Nice to see you. Thanks for coming. Please don't touch me. Hello, how are you? you know, just sort of passing through the crowds. Oh wow. <laughs> um, I think at at diplomat college. The polite smile 101 is one of the, uh, the the most important courses that you can take. And how about wardrobe styles? How does uh, how does His Excellency dress befitting his station? I've chosen pristine clothing. I think that the Olwyn's uh, color palette is uh, lilacs, mauves, purples, and gold trim. Beautiful. Um, lots of flowing robes and headpieces <laughs> and velvet suits and pointy nice. shoes. <laughs> I'm getting like a medieval mixed with futuristic sci-fi look. Yeah, I like it. 100%. Second wardrobe style I've chose is formal wear. I don't know how you go more formal than, than a mauve <laughs> suit. <laughs> I, I guess maybe the space equivalent of black tie, you know, for galas and for openings and stuff like that. I mean, it, what that tells us is that that is what formal wear looks like in this galaxy. Boom, I've done it. I've established that fiction. <laughs> and finally, I've gone for signature hairstyle. So mm. I'll tell you what Alwyn Callahan the 16th hairstyle is. And <laughs> I, immediately what came to my head is the Karl Lagerfeld style of silver grey hair, sort of quite thick and woolly, but then pulled tight back into like a high ponytail. Mm-hmm. And there is not a single strand of hair out of place from this this style. It's all wow. just perfectly pulled That's up so into place. so douchey. I love it. Um, and I think that each of the Alwyn Callahans have got a very unique hairstyle. And you know, the, part of the rules of being a new Alwyn Callahan is you're not allowed to take a hairstyle that somebody else has already taken. Mm. But it's Thank always... In, yeah, yeah. It's so always running out. Slowly but surely, they're running out. In 15, <laughs> 15 previous Alwyn Callahans, nobody's tried the high pony before. <laughs> no. So I think, so I think Alwyn Callahan the 15th, my father would have had uh, dreadlocks. I think the guy before him had like a big afro. I think the guy before him had a uh, 1990s boy band style curtain parting. <laughs> Frosted tips. What Frost, Josh yeah, frosted trying tips. to find 16 distinct hairstyles <laughs> right now. Oh, I don't want to challenge myself that much at the moment, but it might have to come to that. You I think do, basically... You, you can do a Twitter thread when this episode comes out. Done. Okay, want, done. Or a separate, a separate sheet on the documents. You've got obviously <laughs> diplomatic di- dictionary, but also hairstyle. Hairstyle. Right, okay. You'll all know now if I'm very quiet during one particular scene, it's because I'm opening a new tab on this spreadsheet and finding appropriate hairstyles. Yeah, Have basically. Have them uh, ever been bald or would that be like scandalous? I was just about to say, I think perhaps Owen Callahan's got an older brother that had to give up the role because he started to get a bit of a receding hairline. Oh, and they're like, oh, harsh. With, without oh, the haircut, wow. man, you're, you're just... You can't have the Man, role. Ageism is just rife in uh, galactic whoa, politics. Whoa. 100% shout out to all the people like me whose hair is Yikes. thinning. I think, yeah, I, I, I think even, I like the idea that even despite the, we can go we can go at light speed and we can travel like this and we've got laser guns and all these, uh, you know, huge te- futuristic technologies, they still haven't worked out how to do a hair plug. So if you've got no hair, I'm afraid that's it. You can't be, you can't wear a wig. That's just it. Your career is over. So the galaxy is covered with the scammy, hairy Newell cream. Still, then, <laughs> yeah, one hundred percent. You know, you know that, um, you know that shampoo that supposedly got caffeine in it, which I've certainly used in the past. That supposedly makes you grow a full head oh, of the, hair. The German brand, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Alpacin, I think it's called. <laughs> God damn you! I want my money back. Uh, so yes, that is my look and my wardrobe styles. Okay. Um, and the, the specialist pick lists for the diplomat are: you get to choose two things that you believe, and two things that you engender in others. So, what does the slightly slimy politician Alwyn Callahan the Sixteenth believe? So, I've changed this slightly. I think rather than it being choose two beliefs, I think it's choose two campaign slogans. Ooh, okay. <laughs> and I've chosen quite a, a American politics style sounding ones. <laughs> yes. That sound great and when chanted it sound like really really empowering but when you pull into it you're like oh that actually makes no sense it's got no weight whatsoever it's just air so i think the two campaign slogans are the space between will always show the way 
See, sounds amazing, doesn't it? But drill into that, it literally means nothing. Um, and the second slogan is, hope is always stronger than fear. Can't argue with that. I'm pretty sure that's something they say already. I think so. I'm going to Google like, that and see. On Twitter. I'm pretty yeah. sure you'll find it. <laughs> Hashtag believe in Alwyn. Yes. <laughs> Hashtag always Alwyn. Always Alwyn. Always Alwyn. Always Alwyn. Always yes. Alwyn. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, maybe we'll find out in the story whether these are things that Alwyn really believes or whether they're just a hollow facade. <laughs> um, and then what about, uh, what do you inspire in others? Respect and focus. Again, two things that cannot be measured in any way. <laughs> just exist as concept in the ether, but uh, sound very powerful on paper. So, I mean... Just from the two characters that we've got already, I can I can imagine what the potential connection between Revan and Olwyn might be. We've talked about imprinting, and uh, Olwyn does inspire respect. Perfect, uh, and I hope I hope that I can rely on Revan's vote in the uh, upcoming uh, <laughs> Sector Two Five Seven by election. Who shall we do next? Uh, Fiona, our guest star. Why don't you tell us uh, which playbook you picked, why, what drew you to it, and then start talking us through your character. Uh, Guest star. I see the the sci-fi theme happening there. Thank you. (laughs) That was terrible. Anyway, uh, I'm playing, uh, I'm using, sorry, the Aced playbook. Uh, And the Ace is a skilled pilot. Their power comes from their agility, conviction, and nerve. So I was like, "Ooh, that that sounds amazing." We've all seen those those films, you know, like a like a Solo and all those sort of things. We're like, "Ah, oh, got to get there in however past sex, etc." So <laughs> I was like, "Perfect, I'll go for that." So talk talk us through what what is your character's name and pronouns, and let's start then with the uh, with the the look. What do they look like, and what do they wear? So my character is called Jody Shoot. Pronouns she her bit of a combination of things i was like when i was looking over this five minutes before we started as, <laughs> as one does for prep uh, sadly i do not have a spreadsheet uh, sheet <laughs> to look through um so i was thinking about the ace in general this idea of a skilled pilot sort of like a cool dude type thing the thing that instantly came to my mind was like um ace rimmer from red dwarf that sort of like ha ha that sort of thing amazing and then thinking about other things as well so uh jody i was sort of inspired by jody foster who plays the doctor and doctor who uh shoot is actually one of my improv teachers uh, katie shoot who's all into mm-hmm. sci-fi so i was just thinking that sort of like that person who's sort of like very con- like is interested in everything and is confident but to the point not arrogance but sort of that sort of uh that line between sort of like I'm I'm the smartest person in the room because I know everything about this particular thing, which is often the downfall of the Doctor. So, yeah, so looking at the look itself, I went for proud smile and determined eyes. So, again, thinking of that idea of, like, I'm enjoying what I'm doing. This is, this is my life. I love adventure. I love being out there amongst the stars. But... I know what I'm doing. No one, no one could convince me otherwise. Uh, and if they did, then they're clearly wrong in some way. Um, but it's often to the downfall of myself that I don't take on other people's view whilst uh, flying around in space on a, on a ship or two. You, you think you know best. You're. It's the. Uh, oh no, I don't, no, no, I don't think. I okay. Oh, you best. do. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the best way to solve most problems is to is to jump in a in a space fighter jet and uh, blow something up, exactly. right? It, right, that, that seems the sensiblest solution, and I know I can do that. So why yeah. why why are we waiting around here? Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, never wait for orders. Oh, please. Oh, there's, there's so much admin involved in that sort of thing. You know, when it's just if I could just do it and just fix, I know how to fix it. Just let me fix it. That sort of again, that mentality. It's like why aren't you letting me doing my job? So yeah, definitely not not a fan of authority. Perhaps like getting in the way of what I want to do, which I think is the benefit for everyone. But mostly, it's the benefit of myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, tell us about Jodie's uh, uh, fashion sense. What are her wardrobe styles? So, I had a big think of all the sci-fi shows I've watched over the last decade, and the person that instantly came to mind was looking at all these different options. The thing that sort of jumped out to me was neon coveralls, and I'm thinking of like Kaylee and Fireflies. So I was like, done, easy enough. Boom bright neon and thinking greens oranges proper tie-dye s amazing so i you you know when jody is in the room it's like <laughs> <"Bah!"> <laughs> but i also like the idea that she deliberately cho- chooses like these bright colors to stand out most often because she's 
fixing things, uh, you know, something wrong with the engine. So she would normally be covered in grease and oil, like everywhere, like her hair is probably quite mucky and stuff like that. So she's like, well, you know, if you need, if you need me in a stretch or in a pinch, you know who I am because I'm wearing these beautiful, bright, well, I think beautiful. Some would say garish <laughs> <laughs> coveralls. Um, and the next on that, I, because I thought, who else in space, you know, if you need a fixer or an engineer, what else would you need? You need too many pockets. pockets. My goodness. I, you've seen those spacesuits. There's no pockets. I have way too many. Like, if my coveralls are probably just pockets, <laughs> like just everywhere on the sort of this, the straps in the front. I just like the idea of like, oh, give me a second. I do have the keys somewhere and I would sort of definitely spend 30 seconds, but pulling out <laughs> other things, a bit like Hagrid's coat, you know, like, pulling, oh, here's some dog biscuits. Oh, here, I need that for later. And it's, it's glowing. Don't, don't say anything. You know, that's sort of <laughs> getting that up. Um, and then of course, the final thing that would make my look perfect. Uh, of course, again, back to Doctor Who, I saw statement scarf and Ooh, a yeah. thousand percent. It is the longest piece of rubbish you'd ever seen. Different colours, definitely messy. Probably a pocket or two on in it as well, <laughs> <laughs> like, like a like a wedding trail behind me. So incredibly dangerous. Whilst sorting out the ship, at any moment it'll get caught say, in the car. Like, <laughs> like snag on things and bits of <laughs> getting choked. <laughs> like what? But conveniently, it never happens because I know what I'm doing. <laughs> so <laughs> it will probably like whip up quite fast. It's one of those ones, I, you know, like we know Doctor Who has like the sonic screwdriver. I have just the scarf that just does everything. So it keeps me warm in cold climates. I can use it as a rope to go down things. <laughs> it has been with me throughout. And it's just, I guess, not like Doctor Who, because obviously Doctor Who is always it's very knitted and all these different colours stuff. I think it is just like one sort of play of silver. And it, of course, has my name stitched in it, like Jodie oh, the Shoot. Yes. <laughs> what know? a detail. Yeah. So and it's like, and then when, obviously if I'm stood there in the wind, it flaps behind me as if like a, a label <laughs> saying <laughs> like Jody advertisement. Shoots. Yes, for all your for all your piloting needs. Such um, a ver- versatile garment, you know. You, you can exactly you, you can wrap it like a muffler. Depending on how you drape it, it could act as like a cloak or a cape. Yeah, exactly. So good. Exactly. That's amazing. And yeah, you've got you've got pockets for, for enough pockets for all of the rest of us. Hey, hey! If you if you need something held. You, I can hold it, but I don't know when you'll get it back because I don't know which pocket's in, but I will never admit to that. <laughs> oh, you know what that just reminded me of? It's like video game characters where you just keep, you know, they have the magical pocket where, like, they carry all these things that you never, like, where are all these things they carry? Because you never, where, um, that's you. You're, you're, yeah. you're, the, you're, you're it. I, I am that person. It's like, who, I've got a hand axe here. Does anyone want a, a shotgun? <laughs> I've got a stabilizer for something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Did you select too many pockets as a statement on the current uh, state of uh, pockets in women's fashion? Uh, thank you, Your Excellency. And I could not possibly <laughs> deny or confirm, but a thousand percent, yes, we need more pockets, damn it. And we need bigger, deeper pockets. <laughs> I promise to you, uh, constituent, that I will fight for the right to have more pockets in, uh, in women's clothing from here on in. Thank you. I, you have my vote at the next by-election. <laughs> So then the, the specialist questions for the ace, uh, mm-hmm. you get to pick one thing that you long for and then two skills that you have. So tell us about those. Well, a thousand percent, the thing that Jodie longs for is adventure. Being out there, being monster stars, you know, I we don't want to be sitting behind the, you know, the space desk at Space Admin doing all the space forms. That's boring. You want to be out there. You want to, you know, discovering new things and, and living on the edge and every day being different. It sounds a lot different to my own life, so that's why I really want it. <laughs> um, but the two skills I've chosen, I've chosen pushing people's buttons and fixing ships. Because again, that sort of image of like a Doctor Who S type, uh, or the Doctor, sorry, character of just like trying to needle in and finding why, why, why. Just because like, it's the way she gets forward. It's like, why, do you, why are you questioning me on this? I'm the most cleverest person in the room. Uh, you know, And then just telling people to go away or something like that. But then fixing ships, so literally... If you're in the cockpit of the of the ship, you just see, oh, I'm just going to fix this one wire, Boof, like a huge Python-esque like, wires trailing around and just fixing stuff then and there. And then it gets put back and you're oh, I don't know what this bit is for. I'm sure it's fine. You know, that's sort of putting back things. It yeah, must I, not have been it. necessary if it's not gone back in. It can't. It doesn't fit in. What? <laughs> don't need it. <laughs> but no, it wouldn't throw it away. It wouldn't throw it away. Put it into another pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Never know when it would come useful. Oh, she's a hoarder then. Oh, this, I, that, that, this is I would take it straight. I, no, I think uh, always having something just in case, not mm-hmm. a hoarder. <laughs> <laughs> 
This is cool. I've never, weirdly, I've never thought of the Doctor as an ace pilot, but I think it's just because, like, she's not sitting in a cockpit on a joystick, you know, but no. she's still <laughs> piloting a yeah. incredibly sophisticated space machine. Hmm. Which she's which she's definitely fiddled with quite a bit uh-huh. over the years, and there's wires everywhere. You're like, oh, it's in a different room, and down the <laughs> corridor, past the swimming pool. I'll deal with it later because I know best because I'm very clever. Yeah. <laughs> and also, some could argue that the TARDIS itself is one giant pocket. So. <laughs> <laughs> pocket. <Boom. energy. laughs> My head has exploded. <laughs> it's pocket inception. There are pockets in the pockets of the pockets. <laughs> Um, any any further questions about Jody before we move on to next person? Yes. Do, does Jody have like a a pilot name like Jody the something shoot or like like a call sign? A call. Yeah, that's it. A call sign. Because uh, I'm not very quick on it. It'll just be the shoot. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I, I think it's just something like that. I'm, I'm so quick. I just shoot out out of a like a like a bullet out, out of the, the barrel of the gun out of the shoot. <laughs> yes. Uh, so it might, and maybe it's that sort of thing. You know, when you um, you sign up and you have to put the call sign as if it's like for the um, oh, what's it? Is it Spotlight where you have to make sure your your name isn't the same as somebody else's name in the Actors Guild? I, all the pilots have several call signs. You're like, ah, oh, the shoot, it's fine. I'll change it later. Then never been able to change it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like, god damn it! And I'd be cooler, but so I just have to use the name I signed up with. So the shoot. <laughs> Deck officer, launch fighters, shoot, shoot out of the shoot. <laughs> <laughs> so she can shoot. <laughs> the paperwork to get that changed. Oof. It's a nightmare. And and of course, I don't like paperwork. So why would I get it? It's, it's just, pff. I'm the cleverest person in the room. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's recognised now. It, you've built a brand. It's on I the have. scarf. It's on the scarf. I can't. God, can you imagine how much you would get? Because I wouldn't get this the same kind of scarf. It'll be. It won't be the same. It won't feel the same. It doesn't have the same connection. Yeah, absolutely. She's like a disaster, hobo, chaotic pilot, ace lady. Yes. Neon. Neon. <laughs> Just look for neon. The neon, neon and person. dirt. <laughs> yeah. um, I have a question for Jody. Um, honestly, now. Like, how how good are you, though? Like, when you fix things, are you actually fixing things? Or are you just real lucky? You know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Shots fired. <laughs> just Shots wondering, fired, like, how... Shoots how, fired. Yeah, the chances of exploding <laughs> Look, in space, just, hey, just to have, like, a... I fix it to my standard, and as I've already claimed, I am the cleverest person in the room, so you don't need to worry about how good it's fixed. It's fixed to what I think is is appropriate. <laughs> Just imagine the rest of us looking at something you fix, going, I don't feel like this should be working, but it is, <laughs> and I, I don't understand. <laughs> it's it's like there's that meme of the person with the, the giant water cylinder where it's breaking out, and I just slap a sticker on it, and it works. It's like, and it somehow works. Done. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Your tools are wrenches and confidence <laughs> yeah absolutely cool. loving it loving good to all know. of this so luck is on our side that's that's good no i'm on your side and i <laughs> that's what i meant <laughs> you don't need luck when you've got shoot yep <laughs> penultimately strat hello uh been waiting patiently to tell us about which playbook you've picked and why I have picked the Scoundrel playbook because what space drama doesn't have a scoundrel? <laughs> and uh, I haven't played that sort of character in a space game yet. So This is that yeah. roguish playbook Marta was alluding to earlier. Yeah, it's going to be all roguish. So um, my scoundrel is called Val Waldron. Uh, he, him. So... Yeah, Val is your kind of typical, I guess it's like space cowboy sort of thing, isn't it? Living very much in the seedier, uh, more criminal underbelly of the galaxy. Uh, In fact, the little descriptive bit says the scoundrel is a member of the underbelly of the galaxy. Their power comes from connections, recklessness and criminal history. Nice. So, uh, you know, uh, Val shot... Before the other person. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got we've got Jody shoot the shoot, and then Val who shoots first. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh, yes. So um, 
yeah, it, it, very uh, <laughs> similar to Fiona. Uh, this character is uh, maybe half an hour old, so uh, <laughs> we will have to think this up as uh, as we as we go along. That's how the game um, goes. But I think some of the the stuff that I've partic- uh, I've I've picked, particularly the the relationships bit, will do later down the line yeah. um, we'll, we'll bring more character but um, yeah I'm just going to lean into the reckless don't think about things <laughs> everything can be solved with a blaster kind of hey, you, scoundrel you need architect. that attitude in a one shot yeah exactly I, I get to, I get to play Val <laughs> once <laughs> yeah he's going to be shooting great well tell us about Val's uh, look and fashion sense uh, so uh, look uh, Val has uh, a laughing smile him to be kind of like everybody's friend and like instantly just kind of get on with people but the other look is finger on the trigger so all that below so very friendly right up until the point that the blaster is is raised and then it's anyone's guess uh, i just love that family. that combination laughing smile and finger on the trigger just tells you so much in two two little descriptions it's great yeah it was a yeah the 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 way that they've all been I love it. Like with Sleepaway, when we play Sleepaway, with all the options you've got, I love this system with with this sort of thing. It makes it so easy to kind of go, I know who my character is. People that wrote this were good. So wardrobe style, because it actually made me laugh out loud. Space jeans. (laughs) I'm wearing space jeans. I love it. I love it. I love it. (laughs) I imagine other clothes as well as the space jeans, but that's like the, you, you look at Val, maybe it's got like a plaid shirt on, but it's the space jeans you notice. Like the space jeans are the central bit of the ensemble and everything else just flows from there. Exactly. Yeah. That's the signature piece. And I've bought my, built my uniform around that item. <laughs> I'm sorry, Strat. I'm, Strat, I'm going to have to disagree with you there because it doesn't say any other item of clothing on your character sheet. I think you're just wearing jeans. <laughs> just wearing jeans. Yeah, yeah. And maybe braces. That's it. Bare oh chest braces. Braces. and a holster. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh well, I'm glad. I, okay, braces are definitely in there. Yeah. Yes, I am now wearing braces. Thank you, thank you, Josh. Um, but as Martha, I'm glad you mentioned the holster because my second pick is uh, a fancy bolster, uh, fancy blaster holster. <laughs> So that blaster that is uh, with finger all is on the trigger is in a real fancy holster, <laughs> so it can be drawn super quick. It just looks like quality. Are we talking a hip holster or like? Oh, okay. It's attached to the braces. <laughs> it's here attached to the braces. <laughs> it's that underarm draw. Underarm. Yeah. Grand. Amazing. Yeah. Yes, thank you. And we know that fancy in this galaxy means it's like mauve and lilac. And velvet. Oh no, oh no. <laughs> velvet, no. <laughs> Lead into it. I guess, yeah, it is. It, um, it's, it's that fancy with uh, real nice gold threaded uh, with, with uh, Val's initials on it. It's monogrammed. Monogrammed, monogrammed, yeah, monogrammed, yeah. mono, mono yeah. wadded, yeah. monogrammed. Yes, it is monogrammed. <laughs> and, I mean, the VW monogram is very easy to make look kind of beautiful and stylized. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's VW. <laughs> I'm a Volkswagen. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's actually a monogram. It is like an old VW thing from. It's like a, an ancient artifact I found that happened to have my uh, my initials oh, on amazing. it. I was like, I'll keep that. Like, on one of my. It's like a sheriff thing. It's like here's my. Volkswagen. Oh, yeah. Yes, Sarah's badge. Oh. Sarah's badge. Adding Volkswagen to the long list of brands we are not sponsored by. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And definitely not Outprint Shampoo, thanks to Josh's demand for his money back. Um, and I realised I got two to three and I didn't have these. So I'm going to go with big coats as well. Space jeans, big swishy coat. Just to respond to Josh's accusation that you're going topless. Yeah. Oh, no. No no shirt underneath the big coat. Oh. Jeans. Oh, that's a look. <laughs> big oh. coat. Braces. Yes. I'm just getting real Magic Mike vibes off of you now. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm really digging, Val. I, think. I have to say, though, the chafing between the holster, nothing underneath, and also jeans, which I'm presuming you never take off, no wash. It's a whole, it's a whole vibe. I'm not going to lie. I'm digging it. I'm not lying. I'm digging it. Val, Val washes his space jeans. Wait, so whoa, whoa, whoa. There's that thing yeah. about jeans, though, that you have to freeze them so that they they work longer. I thought you'd freeze oh, yeah. them in the void of space. Yeah, Val puts <laughs> them on his ship, just does a quick circuit of the planet, pop down, 
jeans on. <laughs> it's that bit like when you go in the sea where you have to get past a certain point very quickly, but once you've done that, you're good. You're okay. You just have nothing below the waist because it's all frozen off. <laughs> <laughs> Never takes the uh, the braces off though, which confuses a lot of people. Because how are they just attached? Dangling when you've not got the jeans <laughs> on. <laughs> um, so the scoundrel gets uh, three other things to choose. Uh, you get to choose mm-hmm. two things that you have and two things that you used to have but have lost, um, mm-hmm. and also two jobs that you tend to do here in this galaxy. So talk us through these. Uh, so the two things I have. Uh, can't have a fancy blaster holster without a high grade blaster to put in it. Nice. So Val's high grade blaster is probably the most expensive, precious thing he owns. If it were to go away, he would be very sad. It's his sole <laughs> and most trustworthy companion. Does it have a name? Billy. It's Billy Blaster. <laughs> Billy Blaster? <laughs> oh my god. That was straight out of a Chris Darkey score. <laughs> it was. Reaching for a name last minute. <laughs> yeah, Billy. Yeah, apparently. Yeah, going with it. Billy Blaster. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, Val, who are you? <laughs> I love a character who's a mess. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Welcome yeah. to the crew. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he has a, a trusty ship that I stole. Ooh. I'm glad one of us has a ship for Jody to fix. Maybe I was already on the ship and I wasn't allowed. I, I just didn't leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, I go back. I'm stealing this ship. Get off. It's like, yeah. no, this is my... Well, like, okay, if you ship. want. <laughs> you opened a door and there she was. I'm like, hello? Yeah, maybe, maybe I didn't find you in there until like two months down the line. Yeah. <laughs> There's so many rooms. <laughs> oh, that explains a lot. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> didn't, you don't go... There's no reason to go to the engine room unless it's making a funny noise. And that funny yeah. noise is Jody. <laughs> Jody giggling away. Um, yeah, so we have a we have a ship called. Ooh. Oh, here we go. Uh, oh, we strap yourselves straight, in, kids. Straight straight off the top Ready? of the head for the ship name. Uh, Sally, Sally ship. <laughs> <laughs> Mustang Sally. I like it. Oh yeah. Oh must- yes, Mustang yes, Sally. Mustang Sally. Absolutely. There we go. There's the name of the ship. I love this car theme in space. Yeah. So I got, I, yeah, Billy and Sally. Um, and I like that you've cho- you've chosen two very physical things that you have and then two very metaphysical things that you have lost. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so I've lost the ability to relax. <laughs> uh, Val is always on edge. It's probably because his, uh, below his waist is so cold. <laughs> um, <laughs> and you never know when whoever you nicked that ship from is going to come for you. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I think, it, and it also fills in with some of the uh, the the jobs that he does. But yeah, living a life of all, someone's always going to be after him. Someone's always going to want revenge. There's always going to be somebody that's that's not a fan. And uh, he's also lost uh, a hope for the way out. Oh, um, this is his life. It has been his life, and he has pissed off too many people to ever really escape it. There's there's not an, enough. Favors he can repay to to get out of the debt of of everyone in the galaxy. Oh, so no. this is this is who he is. So what is it that he doesn't have a way out of? What are the jobs that he tends to do? Uh, jobs he tends to do uh, bounty hunting, shipping around, finding people, pointing his fancy blaster at them. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh no, it's the holster that's fancy. The blaster's high grade. Um, <laughs> and then uh, also acting as a getaway ship. So where where there aren't bounties, obviously plenty of uh, contacts within the criminal underworld. If someone needs somebody that's going to drive them from A to B, no questions asked. Val isn't part of those gangs, but he's the person you get if your more reliable in-house getaway driver is unavailable due to prior commitments. Part Magic Mike, part Baby Driver. (laughs) <laughs> or Val <laughs> yes fantastic uh, any qu- any further questions about Val I'd love to know in terms of his moral compass where where does you know the, your typical D&D sort of good neutral evil situation where do you think Val falls um, I'm going to fill that D&D grid with faces of scoundrel characters from other things <laughs> and say he's gonna—he's like a, a Mal from Firefly 
yeah. Han Solo sort of moral compass. That's... I, I definitely got mild from Val, Val Val, just because yeah. of the way you looked. <laughs> mm. <laughs> oh yeah, big furry collar on the big coat, Ooh. by the way. So hot up here, so cold. Oh, so hot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's, he's a, a man of, of yeah, it's extremes. It's all over. Yeah, Duality. Exactly. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Choose one extra thing that, that he's lost. The ability to regulate his body temperature. <laughs> like always sweating, but then his legs are like covered in ice. But shaking, it's yeah. very confusing. <laughs> but um, yeah, on that, that's the sort of moral thing. There's, there's certainly lines. Mm. And although he may have had to cross a few of them in the past, like that, that's, there's shape there. Mm. Like that's the bit that he's not at. And probably part of the reason why he thinks he's lost that hope for a way out, like... There have been times where it's like, that's kind of, I, I did that thing that makes me just a a bad person. Yeah. I, that's what I've got to be, kind of thing. Any quirky hobbies you'd rather no one know about? <laughs> yeah. Because that's always interesting in these sort of characters. They have like, I'm just making my little <laughs> what animal makes, What figurines. makes you think Val would have anything quirky uh, going on in his life? <laughs> like you collect miniature unicorns. Yeah, or miniature like unicorns. That. Or like he collects <laughs> cat figurines or something. I, <laughs> I think maybe it is yeah, maybe it is a collect it, it is a collection like the the the, v, the VW badge, like just random junk that like hood ornaments from different spaceships. Oh my yeah, oh, and wow. things from the past that really, really nobody really cares about. Even like the geekiest, most uh, like specialized space archaeologist would be like, it's just rubbish. <laughs> and I've got a whole ship full of it. It's like going into Val's ship. It's like going into one of those really weird themed like pubs where they've just got crap all over the walls. <laughs> You were, you were literally Ariel from The Little Mermaid. You're like, yeah. look at this stuff. Isn't it beautiful? And you're like... <laughs> Are those oh American God. museums in the middle of nowhere where you go yes. and you're like, what? yeah. what's what's the theme of the museum? I'm, I'm confused. I'm sorry. Just just trash. Just So have, have we got two hoarders in our crew now? Right, not hoarders. Collectors. <laughs> okay, co- co- collectors of exotic... Uh, Oddities. Okay, this 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 ship isn't going to take off because it's just going to be rattling around <laughs> with who's its and what's its galore, and we're not even going to be able to take flight. We're overweight. Takeoff procedure does take about an hour longer than usual because I do have to go and tie down a lot of stuff. <laughs> mm. You have to go the weight. Yeah, weight. You can't shift until we're in the air. Go right now. You can leave your seat. And <laughs> yeah. And you got to make sure it's all pinned down when we get into zero g. Otherwise, the whole space is just Everything being just floating float. full of rubbish. I mean, valuable collectibles. My last question, sorry for for Strap. Um, so obviously you've said that you've lost you've lost the hope for a way out. I want to know what originally was your like what what would you ideally want as your way out? What with, if you're away from this life, what is that is it that you dream of that you can no longer at, uh, attain? I guess. I think the idea of the way out was making enough to kind of get out of having to work for whatever like criminal gangs and stuff there were and maybe go and finding just a quiet I don't know whatever whatever sort of like the Yorkshire Dales of planets is and oh. just have a nice little hut and a, a nice uh, like a, a, an out uh, building full of all my wonderful collectibles and like put the uh, my high quality blaster over the fireplace because I don't need to to use Billy anymore, and uh, yeah, just like sit outside on my deck and uh, you, and drink wine. You want it to be Thanos after the snap? Got it, got it, got it, got it. <laughs> oh crap! I do, but <laughs> but without the snap, without <laughs> very the snap. importantly, okay. right? Sure. <laughs> without yeah, his plan to get out wasn't destroying half, half of the all universe. living beings. That that was it. Was probably like robbing a space bank. <laughs> <laughs> it's much lower lower down. Just wants to be a farmer, really. No, no, no. That's too much hard work. You can't happily <laughs> sit and watch other people farm. Get like, robots no, that do the work, that and you just good. like yeah. you have your little uh, chair, yeah. and you're just like smoking a <gasps> yes, space. Yes, it would be a robot uh, when we come to my relationships. <laughs> <laughs> before we before we do our final character, which is which is my character, because I get to play a character in this game. Um, I realise uh, a question I should have been asking all along: Is anybody a cool alien? Wait, that is an option? It's a big galaxy. You can be whatever you like. Just because on my head, because obviously I've basically just taken doctor, the Doctor. Def- definitely alien-ish, mm-hmm. but we no one knows. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> alien adjacent. I like it. Yeah, yeah. alien adjacent. So yeah, definitely. But definitely it l- looks humanoid. Sure. So. 
the, the, the whole BBC Doctor Who is like, oh, it's an alien, just happens to be on two feet and has two hands, but looks like a tree. <laughs> like, that, sort of, <laughs> that sort of kind of alien, I think. So, but yeah. Life developed very much in the same way everywhere it managed to, you know, makes sense. I think for any The Witcher fans, I think Revan is, is probably spliced with s- stuff. Mm-hmm. Doesn't know what, but maybe there's, yeah, there's, I'll have to think about it, but maybe there's a little, like one or two features about them that's a bit like, hang on a minute, human beings don't have that, do they? <laughs> sort of situation. Love it. Love the intrigue. Mm. Okay. Uh, final character is is mine, and I am doing the faintly embarrassing thing of playing a playbook that I wrote instead of one that comes with the game. When the second edition of Galactic came out, Riley Rathal ran a game jam to create new playbooks and new pillars and new bits of rules and add-ons and things for the game, and I contributed a playbook called The Researcher, which is going to tie in very nicely with Val. Strat's character, uh, because the researcher is a kind of like space archaeologist, space academic kind of character. So the researcher pursues the galaxy's secrets and forgotten truths. Their power comes from their curiosity, insight, and persistence. And I based this on characters like uh, Eno Cordova, if you've played the Jedi Fallen Order game, or uh, Dr. Afra, if you've read uh, the Star Wars comics that she is in. So my character, uh, his pronouns are he, him, and his name is Versi Esco Triff. Versi is a title, an academic title like doctor or professor. Uh, so Esco is the, is the name. For my look, uh, I have gone with, uh, <laughs> tying in with uh, Marta's defector, sleepless eyes, except that Esco is not sleepless because of being haunted. Esco is just mostly sleepless because he works too much. <laughs> <laughs> um, doesn't know when to go to sleep while in a flow state doing his research. Um, and excitable hands. Uh, Esco likes to speak with his hands, when he, especially when he is explaining things about galactic history. Nice. Um, and I should say for look, uh, Esco is a cool alien. So imagine like uh, dinosaurs, but dinosaurs as we now understand them, so the feathered kind. Um, so lizardy, but with great colourful plumage. And then imagine that they imagine that a humanoid species, humanoid intelligent species, evolved from them. So humanoid, two arms, two legs, a head, uh, but scaly plumage, bent back knees, slightly webbed fingers. So that's the that's the look I'm going for for Esco. Matt, I just wanted to ask a really important question: How many fingers? Uh, three fingers and a thumb. How many hands? I did. I like. Yeah, let's lean into it because uh, I just keep coming back in my head to uh, to extra arms. So let's say four arms. Oh, cool! Excellent. Nice, amazing. All the better to dust old artifacts with. <laughs> so when you're doing your excitable hands, mm. it is literally like a big, big old show going on. We've all got to take a step back. You're holding one with a coffee in one, yeah, and everything else, and then it's just. Oh, yeah, and you pass it to other hands. Oh, yeah, I can oh, do. I can hold. Grand. I can. I can drink coffee, check my watch, and do jazz hands at the same time. Yeah, it's multitasking heaven. Oh, I love it. Very cool. For wardrobe style, uh, I have gone with practical things: frayed poncho and reliable boots, uh, good for going on digs, um, but also scan visor. So Esco has a thing that usually pushed up on the forehead, but can come down. Is that this kind of asymmetrical? Um, holographic scanning visor thingy for looking through x-rays or looking for um, evidence of things. So the the questions for the researcher are about choosing thing, things that you have discovered uh, and things that you are trying to discover that you are pursuing. So the two things that ESCO has already discovered are, uh, and this might tie in with some of the characters, NPCs and things that we've established already, Dirt on a mandate dignitary. Uh, so I, in the course of my researches, I have turned up something that somebody high up in the mandate does not want to come out that would embarrass them. Uh, I don't know what that is yet. Uh, and I'm excited to find out. Um, and I've also discovered the wreck of the starship Trinary Noon. Again, don't know why it's wrecked. Don't know where the, when it went missing, but I know where it is. And not too many other people do. Um, and then the things that I am looking for, that I'm pursuing, 
I want freedom from mandate oversight. And I think this is, I was thinking about sort of researchers in this galaxy and the, the, the things that are established about the, about the setting before you do any of the character creation are just that there is the mandate who are big, big old space fascists and the liberation who are the rebels fighting against them. And the mandate control most of the galaxy. Mm. So they probably control the universities and research institutions as well. Yeah, anything educational. So one of the things that I want is freedom to be able to do research without the mandate vetting my papers. And potentially tied to that, I'm also looking for the ruins of a pre-mandate civilization. Civilization, cool. And this ties into something I was thinking about that could potentially be a jumping off point for our world building stuff, which is that one of the ways that this kind of uh, fascist government stay in power is by like creating their own version of history. Mm. And so I thought it might be interesting if our version of the mandate, one of the ways that they maintain their power is they maintain this fiction that they, they are the founding civilization of our galaxy and they have always been in power and therefore they're the only ones that ever should be. Like, they gave us everything. Oh, you mean make the galaxy great again? <laughs> no, no, it's always oh, been great. The galaxy, they bought, keep the yeah, galaxy keep great. keep the galaxy great. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I, but I, I have a theory that, they're, that this is all a lie and actually there were, right. there were civilizations before them that they, that they crushed and I'm looking mm. for evidence of those. Interesting, interesting. So it's all built on a lie. That's what I'm hoping to expose. I want to, this thing goes all the way to the top. I want to bring it all crashing down. But, you, but your, your struggle is with the admin. <laughs> as as all, we all know, is, is the true enemy yeah, of I've got the a, universe. The only way I can get this out is if I, is if I publish on the, the, the Black Market <laughs> no. Technical Journal. The, the, the Scientific Nature Journal. The un, yeah. Unnature Journal. Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, any more questions for me about that character? Oh, I was just wondering, how numerous is this species that Esco belongs to? Is he like, is it normal to see one of his kind or is he a bit of a, of a weird find? Uh, I, think, I think we're reasonably common. Yeah, I, I, don't think it's a, I don't think we're an odd sight. Have you got an idea of age for Esco? Is it a young, enthusiastic researcher trying to, like, maverick of whatever the university is, or somebody that's dedicated most of their life? I think I think somewhere in between, like, old enough to have got jaded. So, right. like, oh. was, was a uh, young, enthusiastic, loved learning, loved research, loved uh, discovering new things about the history of the galaxy, and just has come up against so many roadblocks and like unhelpful thesis supervisors and pushback from the the institution about oh no you can't possibly write your you, you can't possibly research that it's prohibited mm-hmm. um and you know that's what's caused me to go a bit more rogue do you think that the mandate are aware of your research hmm i think uh esco doesn't think so but I'm open to the possibility that he might be wrong. And related to that, um, so obviously one of the things you discovered is dirt on a mandate mm. dignitary. Um, apologies if you did mention this, but you said that you you know you know of it, and obviously you clearly don't like the mandate. <laughs> Why haven't you used it mm. against them? What's holding you back? Good question. I think maybe I'm waiting for the the right moment or trying to find the right channel. That like Esco doesn't believe that like the the serenity tactic of just like releasing it on the internet doesn't believe that that will work because the mandate are too powerful. Like there needs to be some sort of more unambiguous, unarguable way of getting this out. Otherwise, it'll just get buried. I need I need more powerful friends who'll help me to disseminate this in a way that will actually have an impact. Because he'd be very familiar with censorship and how, and probably have seen fellow scientists and fellow people who are in academia just like disappear or whatever. So he has a good idea that it's it's harder than it looks. Cool. The sort of archaeology he does. What is is it more? Are you out there with a trowel? I think is what I'm asking. <laughs> 
I think there there is trowel work, but there is a lot of um, like joining the dots and tracing trails of evidence first. This is a big galaxy, so before you can get in there with the trowel, you've got to know where to dig. So a lot of it is detective work about looking at old records and trying to find things that have been suppressed and talking to people and scanning planets for anomalies and that kind of thing, trying to work out exactly where something might be before you can even get stuck in. Keeping in with the dinosaur theme, I'm <laughs> getting some Dr. Alan Grant from Jurassic Park vibes. As yeah. in, you know, at the beginning of the film, he's digging, and then after that, he goes off on a jolly to Jurassic Park, right? So he's got people that sort of help, but it's about the... It's about finding the knowledge first. Yeah. It's about making sure you can establish where the dig is before you start wasting your time digging away and scaring snot-nosed children with velociraptor claws. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that sounds about right. That's cool. I was wondering, though, if he has he's one of those people who has, or, or, or lizard people, who <laughs> has... Um, you know those Uncharted or even, I think, Liara on Mass Effect has this... These holographic walls of like red strings attached and like and he's one of these like oh let me tell you about my theories and it's just three hours of like impossible to follow connections with galaxy maps and you're like i'm i'm just gonna walk out of the room 100 <laughs> percent. i have a huge holographic conspiracy wall i love that with, with idea the four, with the four arms pointing yeah. at different parts of it <laughs> at various points <laughs> I move that move stuff around on it like minority reports. Like minority oh, report, exactly. Yes. Oh, fantastic. So now that we know a little bit about these five characters, uh, we need to establish just in very brief, broad strokes, uh, some connections between them. So all of the playbooks have some questions to ask. Um, and let's go in the same order again. So starting with Marta and the defector. Mm -hmm. Can you ask one of these questions to Josh and one to Fiona, please? Yes. Oh, I need to pick one. Okay. Uh, ooh, interesting. Um, okay. So for Josh, what was the first thing you noticed about me? The fact that you are a baby duckling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. Um, I think that the Callahan family and most politicians are good at reading people. And so I think there was something behind your eyes that Olwyn noticed. And you've said that, that Revan, they have a sort of a facade that at first is sort of frightened and defensive. But I think that Olwyn saw through that and saw there was more beyond the fear in your eyes that could be uh, ushered out, helped out. Awesome. And then for Jodie. <laughs> oh, these are all so good. Uh, this one, though. What did I do recently that made you finally feel like you could trust me? Ooh. Well, that's very interesting. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the cleverest person in the room. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> um, I think... Because you sort of you are a person that wants to, uh, you're, you want to be knowledgeable about the space between you want to know about all these big things, and maybe maybe you consider Jodie an expert on it because she keeps saying she's the cleverest person in the room, <laughs> and I think you just spend a lot of time listening to her. I, we we have created characters who are like who like talking a lot, by the way. So I can't wait for this to happen <laughs> in session. Yeah, I'm just gonna be quiet the whole session and be like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> But I think we we might be on if we're on the ship or, or on a ship, depending on how we've met and stuff. I would have been like in the middle of some like really th deep like problem with one of the engines and or trying to maneuver something and and just like talking it through. And you sort of are listening, and then you give out these little bits of insight. So, would you consider this being an example? Not saying like you're wrong, but you're saying, have you considered this other part? And I'm like, <laughs> yes, 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 no, you're brilliant. You're, oh, that's brilliant. And that's sort of like, you sort of taking apart what uh, Jodie has said and, you know, just going, so in short, you think X, Y, Z, have you considered A, B, C? And just being able to almost <laughs> be a shoot translator. <laughs> um <laughs> It's like, yes, you get me. You're brilliant. And I think that that's what it is. You, you've managed to sort of, you listen enough and have picked up, you know, even like the smallest surface point, which most people would have just ignored, I think. Yeah. Or, or maybe just go, oh, that's too much. That's too much like a wall of um, just jargon. I yeah. think that 
it's just because you want to know and you are so mm. keen to know about space and the big things and everything like that. So yeah, I think it's just like, because you did listen and you, you summarised and pointed out thing and I'm like, yes, you get it. So yeah. Cool. Nice. Uh, Josh, next. Can you ask one to Marta and one to Strat, please? Mm. Hello there, constituent, Marta. <laughs> uh, do you find me comforting or cold? Interesting. Um... Can we answer that? (laughs) (laughs) Um, I mean, you are wearing a lot of velvet, but um, it's like, oh, I want to touch it. Um, The most comfortable of all materials. Comforting or cold? That's that's good. I think, again, Revan is deeply familiar with people like His Excellency. So they would be able to tell when he's being honest and when he's being facetious or full of bullshit so in a way I think it's comforting because she knows Alwyn she knows this kind of person and she knows how to gauge that really really well it's basically the people she's grown up around and only the the ones she knew were like super high level and very good at the game so Alwyn is very accessible in that way he's not like that complicated so I think it's comforting in a way for her just reminds her of aspects of her old life and because he seems to be seems to be halfway decent it's it's not as you know she's not worried or or antagonistic towards him necessarily nice i think we've got a nice relationship blooming at the moment it's the start i see of i see your friendship. potential and you find me comforting <laughs> nice uh, and strat val mm, i think we're a bit chalk and cheese so i'm going to go for the question what agreement did we come to recently I think the agreement was to transport you somewhere, no questions asked. And I think you, you know, usually you would you'd never be seen anywhere near the company of someone. So, although I do not know exactly why I took you where I took you, I think there was a, a generous payment made for that trip nice i think perhaps olwyn also requested that val start wearing shirts or t-shirts underneath his braces <laughs> but that was the that was the first thing that was disagreed on yeah struck out of the bed off the table yeah. <laughs> thank you fiona next can you mm. ask uh one to marta and one to me please Excellent. Okay. Um, and for you, Matt, mm-hmm. uh, Esco, do I impress or exhaust you? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, th- I think you impress me. I think there's there's something about uh, all of my knowledge is quite theoretical and about dead things and very old things. Um, and that is true of pretty much everybody that I know at the institution that I am from because you know that's what it's all about surround yourself with people interested in the same subject and you might be the first person i've met who's a real expert in things that are practical and that actually help right now in the moment excellent yeah no i like that i'm a, i'm an expert in quotation marks in the real things of the moment no mm. i like that very good and uh marta I'm going to, okay, I'm going to say, why did I put myself in danger for you recently? Okay, so I imagine Revan was at a space station somewhere, the sort of place where ships go to refuel and, you know, and they were trying to book passage on a ship and things went a bit awry and you happened to be around and noticed what happened and kind of covered for them and pretended she was part of your crew. And because you have a na- you've made a name for yourself and so people do recognize Jody the shoot. They mostly left us alone, but I think some 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 less savory characters might have tried to I'm not sure if they would have tried to directly attack us or somehow do you have a ship of your do you have this is an interesting question isn't it if you have a ship of your own or not Mm. 
Well, I I would consider <laughs> I am on a ship. Whether it's mine or not is kind of up to Val. Yeah, <laughs> I think they try to ambush us in the station, and you fought them off with somehow with your pockets, some stuff in your pockets got us out of a pinch. I was kind of still in a daze. Revan was still in a daze. Didn't know really how to deal with this because it's pretty early early days and then you just took possession potentially of their ship and got us both out of there even though you had no reason to help me you don't know very much about me and given Revan's profile just being around them is pretty dangerous so that's that's my answer I love it really I think that's really good so yeah Val not only finds me in the engine core but also Revan and we're like Hello! <laughs> One of the most high profile defectors <laughs> who's like Hi. big, big wanted sign on their back. <laughs> like, <laughs> I love the idea is, ah, finally, you got my you got my calendar invite for a meeting. Um, what's happening with the ship? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that love it. I think that those sound really good. That's great. Uh so Strat, can you ask one to me and one to Josh? Okay. Uh you Matt, how did I get you tangled up in my escapades recently? Oh, this is good. I feel like if you've got you've got artifacts and and bric-a-brac and stuff aboard the ship, you must know somebody, like some sort of trader or fence or something like that. And I probably know them as well and maybe I was asking for information on some sort of pursuit that I'm I'm pursuing and this person basically directed both of us in the same direction without telling either of us and when I got there it was already some sort of dangerous situation maybe the mandate were there as well and I just was swept up by your confidence <laughs> and ended up just following what you were doing because I fell out of my depth I was like, sure. I don't want to do what those bad people are doing. This is the only person, only other person here. Uh, I'm going to pal up with them. <laughs> sure. So the thing is, maybe I, I was after, I was looking for something to, I was looking for some sort of research insight and you were looking to steal something, maybe. Was the thing I was looking to steal the same thing that you were looking yeah, probably. to get insight from? Or the the other alternative, if you're a bounty hunter, is that is that you were looking f- for me and I got swept up in your escapades because I was a bounty you were looking for. Because the mandate knows about what I'm trying to do and they want me brought in discreetly. I don't think Mal... I think Mal's bounties are lower. Oh, okay. I don't like the idea <laughs> of Mal working directly for the mandate that's fair yeah. okay yeah we were after the same artifact in that case and i i want to study it and you just wanted to sell it or fence it or put it in your ship collection yes i'm just gonna hang it on a wall <laughs> uh and then josh was the other how have i grown on you recently firstly great question thank you <laughs> uh i think that the 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 ne'er do well aspects of your personality and the sort of chaotic freedom that you have being, you know, a, a freelance agent that can do whatever they want. I think that initially I found that uh, I didn't respect or appreciate that because all that Alwyn has known is he will grow up to become an Alwyn Callahan. And he went to a very restrictive boarding school and then on to diplomat college and so i think that that is the only path that olwyn knows and so seeing you in your cool braces and your awesome ship (laughs) being free to explore the galaxy and pick up whatever contracts you want i think slowly but surely i've grown more appreciative and respectful of that lifestyle and there's been one or two incidences where Val's just done something really, really cool. You know, hung out the, the back of a spaceship shooting his blaster pistol or like won a game of space poker in a bar or, you know, just did something really, really cool. And Alwyn's like, oh, damn, that was awesome. <laughs> I've never been able to do that. And I think slowly but surely Alwyn is warmed towards Val. I'm putting Alwyn has been taken in by the general chaotic nature of Val. <laughs> 
Finally, I am going to ask one to Strat and one to Fiona. So, Fiona, first of all, what lost thing have you asked me to help you find? So see how you find this. I like the idea that obviously you are a person, you know, who has, you know, you make discoveries, you do stuff. And I'm like, I can't find the key to my locker. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I'll describe it. It's like a Yale key. <laughs> um, it's on a, a lanyard and, I, and we will spend like hours of me going through all my pockets. It's not there. <laughs> and as a result, I've not been able to get into the locker, which I insist holds something important. Ooh. But... Like, I, I never really describe what it is, and every time we always pass that locker, there's always something happening, whether it's, like, lights coming out of it, a weird <laughs> smell. It could be just, like, a gone-off lunch or something like that. But it's, it's like, one of those things I would say it's not imperative for me, but I'm like, oh, uh, let's go, um, the key, any, any, any findings, anything like that? And, like, I, because I, I think, well, you're good at finding things, and you're, you know, you're brilliant at finding things, and I've got so much on now because I am the smartest person in the, you know, that sort of horrific <laughs> stuff. So I, almost like a lost property. <laughs> and, and this is a real challenge now because it's like, I, I found the wreck of the Trinary Noon, yep. which could have been, a, I had to search <laughs> the whole galaxy. What do you mean I can't find this key in just these pockets <laughs> and, or in this ship? <laughs> So, so yeah, instead of taking it as an offence, like, so obviously I'm making you do, like, a small task, you're like, well, I have to find yeah. it now. Anyone can find it. <laughs> and yet it's been six months and <laughs> I still can't open my lock. <laughs> Fantastic. Love it. Um, and finally, Val Strat, is, mm-hmm. my, is my interest in you welcome or intrusive? It is welcome. I think... Everybody else in the galaxy seems to think that Val's collection is just a load of old stupid junk. But the fact that you're interested in even one of the items in it <laughs> is a, a a novelty. And also, I think Val probably takes advantage of your wide not bit of knowledge to say, so what is this thing? Mm-hmm. So what is this thing? So what is this thing? <laughs> What's this thing? And it is actually finding out what all the this, this, this stuff is. And through uh, you has found a whole new dimension to my wonderful collection of stuff. Love that. So we're both using you for other things other than your actual purpose. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like an antiques roadshow situation with you two in that room. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, so is this worth anything? Jody come in and sit down at a table with Esco and go, so we brought this along. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, well, it's got sentimental value. I'm like, well, obviously. <laughs> and then take it back, put it back into a different pocket. <laughs> I'll categorize. Oh, boy. Oh, this, is, this is all brilliant. I already love our space family. I think, unless anybody has any further follow-up questions, we are ready to play. Woo! Let's go to space. This has been The First Nova, a studio production from Merely Roleplayers, starring Matt Boothman as Esco Triff, Josh Yard as Olwyn Callahan the 16th, and Strat as Val Waldron, guest starring Fiona Howitt as Jodie Shute, and introducing Marta da Silva as Revan. The theme music is by Alexander Pankhurst, and the episode was edited and produced by Matt Boothman. We were playing Galactic, a role-playing game by Riley Rathal. You can find Galactic and many other fine games at metagame.itch.io. Merely Role Players is a Foggy Outline production in association with Blackshaw Theatre Company. Until next time, if drama be the food of life, play on. Oh, we've, oh, lost, we've Matt. lost Matt. Lizard Man was ejected into space. <laughs> Ella among us. Bye. <laughs> he was the betrayer. The betrayer. The very force <laughs> of mother's presence. <laughs> <laughs> it enough, to it, enough to inject anyone out into space. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>